We're here to fight for truth, justice, and the American way. Welcome back to the Essential Films Podcast, a podcast devoted to the discussion of the greatest movies ever made or the Essential Films. I'm Adolfo Acosta, and I'm joined by my co-host, Mr. Mark Espinoza, and we are back from the Phantom Zone. How you doing, Mark? Pretty good, pretty good. Uh, I don't know if you knew about this, but uh, there is a new... Uh, this is a very timely show, now that I'm really thinking about it. But there is a new uh, sci-fi channel show called Krypton, and I didn't know... Uh, I didn't know uh, I didn't know that existed until about a month ago. So, and yes, I, I said Krypton on purpose. I was about to so. say you said it like a Marlon Brando there. Damn uh, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have heard of it. Um, frankly, it sounds awful. Um, <laughs> because why do you want to watch Superman's grandpa? I don't know, but whatever. I mean, seriously, that's the that's the purpose of the show, right? It's hey, your grandson is gonna be really important in the future but this show's not really about that it's about a bunch of boring stuff awesome. yeah it, it, i think uh i think maybe the first season or two will be good i don't mean i don't know i haven't watched the pilot yet so i have no idea of its quality but uh the th- that ha- this happened to me with smallville like the first couple seasons were pretty good and then like it just got ridiculous and that's i think around like season four i really stopped watching it but my sister was a huge fan of that show yeah. Um, but but I think after five, like, it was like it got just too too ridiculous. I mean, I'm like, okay, I'm I'm done. <laughs> yeah, Smallville was weird it, to me. It, see, I think it dipped and it came and then it redeemed itself. So because like, um, I liked the show. I liked the sh- so like the first season I wasn't into it. Then the second season, then like second, third, and fourth season got good. But then like when he went to college and stuff, that's whenever it kind of started to suck. Yeah, <laughs> but then it kind of came back around the loop when it started getting really comic booky. Like it started introducing like other superheroes and stuff. Right. That's whenever it kind of picked back up for me. Like that's when you saw like Green Arrow, not the Arrow we see now with uh with a uh, Stephen Amell, but like the other guy who had who I don't remember his name. Um, yeah. And uh, you saw the Flash, and you saw some other superheroes and stuff. I think that's whenever you start. That's when it started to pick up again. So. You know, it could end up being like Smallville, where it ends up being kind of good, or it could be like Gotham, where it kind of sucks. So, yeah, oh yeah, I'm, let's not even get into Gotham right now because I watched maybe half of season one and I stopped. So <laughs> that's, how, that's how that went for me. Like, I think I never I, went back to that. I think I gutted through the whole season one, and then I, when when season two came around, I was like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> you know. And, and I don't know if it's necessarily like the show itself's fault. Like it's just television for me. I I just don't have time for it anymore. There's just so much stuff, you know, other things to do. You know, I, I'm so consumed with you know re- watching old movies and going to the movies and doing movie stuff and then cons- you know other stuff <laughs> with my personal life. I don't have time for TV shows anymore. I don't think I have a TV show anymore that I watch regularly other than WWE, and that's because I have to. I feel like, but uh. But, I mean, I stopped watching Walking Dead. I stopped watching The Big Bang. I stopped watching a lot of stuff, like, this year. And it's just because I don't have time for TV anymore. And then uh, to, to squeeze in this Krypton show, like, I don't even think I'm going to be able to get to it. Yeah, I don't watch live TV anymore. I, I basically wait for stuff to be um, completely – for, like, a season to be completely done before I even start watching it. Like, I uh, I watched Game of Thrones – uh, I was current on Game of Thrones up through like season four, I think, and then I think I just got way too behind. And, I, and now at this point, I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna wait for the series to finish, and then I'll get them all on Blu-ray and watch them that way. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, so that's that's how I'm gonna have to finish watching. And the thing, is, what sucks about it is you get things spoiled, but you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, as far as Gotham goes, I, 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 from what I hear, it has gone like full like comic book crazy, like. With like the Riddler and the Joker and, and all sorts of stuff running around, but it, it's still not enough to like entice me to see it. Yeah, same here. Let's talk about Superman. All right, so let's talk about uh, the movie that we're here to uh, talk about: Superman the movie from 1978, um, directed by Richard Donner, with a story speaking of the Godfather by Mario Puzo, uh, based on Superman by uh, Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster. Starring Marlon Brando, Gene Hackman, Christopher Reeve, Ned Beatty, Jackie Cooper, Glenn Ford, Margot Kidder, Valerie Perrine and her boobs, Aaron Stamp, and <laughs> Susanna York, with music by John Williams. Uh, it was released in on December 15th, 1978, uh, which I always used to think it was like a, a summer blockbuster release, but it was around Christmas, which is interesting. Um, yeah. So 
first question is like, well, like we always ask on this show. Well, when did you first experience Superman? I don't know, man. See, with, with movies like this, it's hard to pinpoint the first time because these are classics that have been shown throughout the course of history since their release. I know that my grandfather was a huge fan of this movie. My mother loved this movie. My uncle loved this movie growing up. And uh, I'm pretty sure at some point in my early uh, childhood years, I was shown this movie at some point. I don't remember it at all. But they swear up and down to me that they put this on for me all the time, the VHS tape. So I'm going to believe them. But the first memory I have of really watching it, understanding and enjoying it was probably when I was in high school. And uh, I believe it was around that time that they did the DVD release. Uh, I think it was yeah, the, the the ultimate collection. I think it was either uh, in high, when I was in high school or like when I ch- had just gotten out of high school, just started college. They had released that huge anthology set uh, with Superman one through four. And I think Superman Returns was included in that as well. And when I started watching it from that set, that's when I started to, like that's when I really remember watching it like from start to finish, remembering it and appreciating it for what it was. And uh, I mean, what can, we're going to talk about it, you know, on on the show. But I mean, what can, what what can we say right now as far as just to summarize it? it it's a classic. You know, I, I've said it before already. Uh, this is a movie that. A lot of people grew up with a lot. Of, this is the uh, quintessential superhero film for a lot of people. Uh, and throw in all the CGI special effects you want in today's superhero films. You know, something as simple as this will do it for a lot of people. If a lot of old school people. And uh, I can't wait to start talking about it. But that's it, it was probably just to answer your question. It was probably around either I was in high school or I had just gotten out of high school when that set had come out. And that's where I remember really watching it for the first time and really enjoying it. Yeah, uh, I had um, – the first time I had seen it, I, I, the first recollection I have of watching Superman on on film was actually probably Superman 2. And then um, – because – and then like Superman 1, uh, I, I think I watched afterwards. And then they both kind of started blending together and then I'd watch Superman 3 and 4. And then – so I think I actually saw I, – I think I'm, I'm – uh, I'm old enough to have seen Superman 4 in the theater, unfortunately. Um, but Superman's 1 through 3, I remember when I was growing up as a kid, because they would always play constantly on TV, I never really remembered which one was which, you know? Um, even though, like, yeah. obviously now, the, the quality of Superman 3 is way below 1 and 2. But um, I never remembered which one was which, so I just I just kind of all... When you're a kid, you don't really care. You just kind of, you, oh, Superman's on, I'm going to sit and watch this. And I never had... It, so, it wasn't probably until like my teenage years when I got like the VHS tape that I that I remember it properly uh, as like when I saw. I mean, I had seen it before, as I, but I just didn't remember which one was which. Uh, it probably wasn't until like I was a teenager when I got the VHS tape that like the big clamshell VHS tape, right? Um, uh, what Superman one actually was. We'll get into this a little bit later, but uh, Superman, you know, not only just being one of the first superhero films, but it really taught me uh, an appreciation for like just like the just the the boy scout hero you know what i mean and it taught me like right. this is what a superhero movie should be and this is what a superhero is and it it kind of started this lifelong appreciation of what of Christopher Reeve and um to the point that when he and we'll get to this a little later but when he passed away in 2004 that was the first time a celebrity death ever actually affected me uh, because he was like a legitimate hero of mine when I was a kid because, I mean, he was a superhero. And right. so to me, that was that was hard to deal with whenever he passed away. So, um, yeah. But, yeah, so Superman, I saw it many – all the different incarnations when I was a kid. Um, so that that's how I kind of first came into it. Right, right, and um, I mean, I, and you kind of just said it perfectly. He was he was Superman for a lot of people. He was the quintessential he superhero still is to me. Like, I'm yeah, sorry, it, no offense, Henry Cavill, and your fake mustache, but um, yeah, you're you're not Superman. <laughs> I, love, I love how you oh, you only said Henry Cavill and nobody else, considering that Brandon Routh. <laughs> Remember Brandon Routh? Yeah, like you know Brandon Routh. <laughs> Brandon Ralph wasn't bad. Like, you know, and the thing is about that movie, it's been a while since I watched it. 
it's not a terrible movie. It's not a great movie, but it's not a terrible movie. It gets a lot more hate than it deserves. Um, and Brandon Routh did a really good Christopher Reeve impression, but he just wasn't Christopher Reeve. Exactly. Bro, I, whenever I think of, of that guy, I think of what Patrick Stewart said in Ted, bro, where he goes like, remember Brandon Routh from that god-awful Superman movie? <laughs> I don't remember that. <laughs> that was in Ted at the end because um, uh, I forgot what happened. But I think that well, that that snotty kid that well, that had kidnapped Ted, he be, he says he grew up to become Brandon Routh or something <laughs> or something like that. I can't remember what it is, but oh my gosh. that's when uh, that's when he goes like, "Remember Brandon Routh from that god awful Superman movie?" <laughs> so whenever I think of Brandon Routh, I think of Patrick Stewart saying his name <laughs> and shitting on him. So that was that's pretty awesome. Hey, but man, I, whatever, I, Brandon Routh's got it better than us right now. He's he's on a he's on a one of those CW shows. And he's making good money, so. Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, props to that guy for for still getting a payday <laughs> after that. But uh, but I mean, still <laughs> that god awful Superman movie. <laughs> anyway, continue. Um, but yeah, so it's it's you know it's weird now to imagine with movies like Black Panther making a billion dollars and event. You know, we just got an Avengers Infinity War trailer a couple you know like a, a week ago or something like that, uh, or earlier this week. Uh, and that's going to make a billion dollars, you know that. Um, but it, it's hard to imagine in today's day and age with like Marvel and a little bit of DC dominating the the multiplexes that there was a time when superhero films weren't a thing. Um, they were pretty much non-existent. Um, now, Superman is not the first superhero movie. Uh, it is because back in the 40s, they, they had movies that uh, like... Um, uh, they had movies from comic strip characters like Dick Tracy and The Phantom, um, and uh, I don't know if The Shadow made it in back then, but uh, but they also had um, they also had serials with uh, Flash Gordon, uh, Captain America, which is awful, uh, and um, yeah. and Batman. And they had two different Batman serials. Oh well, yeah, I know um, about those. And then they even had a, a Superman serial back in the day um, with. Uh, I think his name was Kirk Allen, a Superman. Um, and if you buy one of the uh, major Blu-ray sets, I think the original uh, Superman versus the Mole Man series was was in one of, was in one of those Blu-rays. <laughs> um, so it, it wasn't. Oh, and I think uh, Adventures of Captain Marvel, which was a uh, which is what a lot of people know as Shazam now. I think he had his own serial too. So a lot of people. Um, you said you said Shazam, not Kazam, right? No, Shazam. <laughs> <laughs> Shazam. I'm just making sure, bro. We, we, we're not talking about Kazam here. We're no, talking no, about no. Shazam. Not Shaquille O'Neal as a genie. Yeah. Um, no. And then, you know, obviously you also had the George Reeves television show um, uh, of Superman, too. So oh, yeah, of course. there have been many times that there have been superheroes on film. Um, but this is the first time it was a major studio production with major money behind it as a major studio release. Um, at the time, it was uh, it had a budget of fifty five million dollars, which at that time was the biggest budget movie. Uh, it was the biggest budget a movie had ever had up to that point. Um, so this is this is a this is an enormous uh, this is an enormous movie at the time, um, and that had never actually happened before. Yeah, and uh, you could argue. I mean, it, it's you could probably point just the birth of these uh, the the modern Marvel movies, the modern you know Chris. Let's just I'll even throw Nolan in there, the, the Nolan Batman trilogy. All those movies, you can kind of trace their origin to the success of S- Superman the movie, because with with that failing, you know who knows how long it would have taken for that for that uh that whole, I guess, genre of, of movies to recover. Yeah. And, and I don't think, I don't think if you, if it would have, um, if it would have failed, um, I don't know when you would have seen another attempt because, and the thing is, even with that success, you still didn't get other superhero movies until Batman in 89. You had Superman sequels, um, but they, you know, they dropped in quality as each one went on. Even, you know, Superman two is pretty good. 
but it's it's not as good as Superman one, and then um, Superman three is really bad, and then Superman four is an atrocity. Um, so you didn't get like any like new superhero movies till Batman, and then Batman kind of dominated the '90s, and you didn't really get any other new superhero movies. There's a couple in there that were that were just throwaways, like The Shadow and and Billy Zane and the Phantom. Damn um, right. And uh, hell yeah, bro. And and you had Spawn and Steel, but those were all terrible movies. Dark um, Man. <laughs> no, Dark Man is an awesome movie. Don't don't. I love Dark, Dark Man, Man, bro. No, I'm throwing him in there because he's awesome. That's why. Although I don't know if Billy, he can, Bill, does he count Billy Zane's super- awesome too. Yeah, Billy Zane is awesome. I don't know if you count Dark Man as a superhero though. I mean, because he doesn't have superpowers. He's just kind of a dude in a with a melting face. From what I've, um, well, Batman doesn't have superpowers either. That, that's true. That's true. Good point. Good point. <laughs> um. But it wasn't until the 2000s that we finally started getting X Men and Spider Man and uh, um, a you know new Batman franchise and uh, Iron Man and all that stuff. So um, yeah, it took a while for superheroes to kind of become a, a genre because up until up until because Superman dominated the 80s. So if that would have failed, who knows if we ever got, would have gotten Batman '89. Um, Exactly. Uh, who knows if we would have ever gotten, you know, the X Men in two thousand, whenever that launched the kind of the modern superhero renaissance. So, um, and uh, yeah, so it's it, it is an important milestone of a film. Right. You could you could call Superman the Godfather of superhero movies because, like we said, without this movie succeeding, who knows how we, if like we would have gotten Batman, if we would have gotten X Men eventually, if we would have gotten and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You know, so it, it's it's it is an important milestone in the, not only the history of cinema in general, but in the history of superhero films. Um, yeah, and then this film. So, like I said, the 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 kind of the budget and the kind of uh, the production behind this was unprecedented. You know, the summer before you had um, you had Star Wars. Which was in one of the biggest hits of all time, yeah. um, but you know this movie kind of tried to you know it, with a lot of the Star Wars special effects, you know, a lot of that was done with models and and you know practical effects. Where how can you have a practical effect uh, back then of trying to make somebody fly? And you know, yes, they used wires and things like that, but they had to make it look as convincing as possible. Now that's CG, mm-hmm. that's easy, right? Yeah, that's easy to do. But back then, this was a huge undertaking for them to try and figure out, which is probably – which is, I think where a lot of the budget went to. Yeah. I, I was watching this back right before we, we recorded, and you know, I'm trying to – like eat for, for even for today, the special effects were pretty awesome because it's easy to just sit there and say, oh, that's a green screen they're behind. Oh, they're on wires. It, it, you know? But when you kind of just lose yourself in the film and you start just watch it as a film, you don't notice that. It's really hard to like uh, kind of uh, not have that suspension of disbelief. You watch Superman and Lois Lane flying over Metropolis, and, you're tr- <laughs> and me, this is because this is how my mind works now. You're trying to pinpoint, oh. Can I tell it's CGI? And you kind of can't. Not CGI, but like green screen. And you kind of do. But it's still good enough that to a casual viewer, it's still going to look good. And to me, even as as a seasoned veteran of movies, it still looks good. It still holds up today. So major props to the production team and everybody involved in the special effects for this movie because that whole sequence of them flying was really well done. And it was very... uh. Very convincing, and, and it just and just that whole sequence itself just adds to the just the spectacle of the of the film itself. Yeah, even though that is to me like the worst part in the movie with the whole "can you read my mind" thing, which I, I can't yeah, stand. Oh, yeah. To this day, I'm like, oh god, kill, 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 fast I, forward. I, when, 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 she, when I was listening to that, I thought about that song from that movie Fifty Four. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, but it reminded me. Like, can you read my mind? No, no like, I don't oh, think okay. I don't think I've I, I don't remember that song. You never, you never, you never saw her. <laughs> I've seen Fifty Four, but I don't remember that song. That, that was the theme song, bro. It was like that dance hit. Or I don't know what it's called, but man, I don't remember that. <laughs> Whatever. But you know, the funny thing is, is that um, 
not the funny thing, but what, what's you know, you mentioned how good it looks, and yeah, there are times when you look at it and you're like, all right, that's he set someone in front of a green screen or a, or a, actually back then it was probably a rear projector, right? A rear projection, um, right? But there are points in this movie where, like, like for example, after the point where you know um, he becomes he transitions from a teenager into a man after he like kind of goes to that training with Jor El. And then you first see him in the costume when he flies out of the uh, Fortress of Solitude. That's a very convincing effect. Like he, when he, you don't see the wires. Like you see him at the very back of the of the fortress, and then he flies to the camera and out. And it's a beautiful effect. Like you can't tell at all. Yes, and and it's one of those things. It's, uh, I have a I have a mini story. So that scene. Okay, so right around the time when Smallville was on the air, which we talked about Smallville already earlier, but around the time when Smallville was on the air, this is around, I think, during the later seasons, somebody had made a YouTube video about how the, the series should end, and it ends with that scene. So I, I forgot like what they spliced together, but it was some scenes from like the show, um, and then at the end of it is that scene from the first Superman from this movie – where after his training and he's in the Fortress of Solitude and then he flies off, that's the that's what they put at the end of how Smallville should end. And that would have been wacky if they had ended it that way with that that clip with Christopher Reeve flying away. But that's why that scene always sticks with me because I saw it in the YouTube video about how Smallville should end, and that's really how it should have ended in my opinion. But the ending itself was pretty good. Um, but that scene is such a – it gets you ready. It, that's the end, I believe, of the second act because you have the first act on, on Krypton – as Marlon Brando likes to say, you have Act Two with Clark Kent as a teenager, and then him getting trained by Joe Earl, and then Act Three, you finally, you finally get into Metropolis, and uh, but the way that that gets you ready, you, you see him like in the full gear, and you just see him fly off. You're like, you're ready, you're like, oh man, it, it's time, man, it's time for Superman. So and finally, so that that's I love that scene because it gets you, it gets you pumped for what's to come. Yeah, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the how the format of this film worked for another superhero movie, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. But yeah, that that is because you don't see him in that costume well into an hour, at least an hour into the film. Um, forty, uh, forty, uh, no, no. You go to Metropolis forty eight minutes in, and you first see him in the costume about an hour and two minutes in. So yeah, you're right. Because <laughs> I I remember I, I kept track because I hit the display button. As I was watching it just now, and then when – as soon as he flies off and they show Metropolis in the cab, it's 48 minutes into the movie, bro. And then once he finally shows up as Superman for the first time, it's like an hour, hour two, I think. So that's that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so the film uh, – what's interesting is DC Comics, the publisher of Superman, uh, was not yet owned by Warner Brothers at this point. So it's, it's kind of a lucky – it's kind of lucky for them that whenever they did, uh, when they did acquire, uh, that Warner Brothers eventually did acquire DC Comics, and they didn't have to like get the film rights back from some other co- production company or something whenever they released it. Um, but the actual producers of the film that was the uh, the Salkine brothers, um, who are these kind of wacky. I think they're Russians uh, who who just kind of bought the film, bought the rights from DC Comics. And they kind of wanted to make this this kind of really campy version uh, of Superman. That uh, once Dick Donner, uh, the super, the director of the film, uh, got on board, he kind of he kind of shaped it in a different way. Even though it still is a little campy at parts, um, but uh, it was a long process. They got the rights in 1973, but they didn't. But obviously, the film didn't come out until 1978. So there was a long process of, in getting the director, getting the screenwriter to adapt it. Um, getting the um, and obviously casting everybody. So uh, this is this is a long time in the making. This film. Yes, yes. Um, um, I, I can't wait to really start getting into the meat and potatoes of this because <laughs> there's a lot of stuff I noticed this time around that was a little wacky and maybe maybe I'm seeing it a little weird. But um, like for example, <laughs> just <laughs> I love making fun of Marlon Brando and Krypton. But that's just, like, there, I'm sure that there's there's stories about Brando on the set, right? Like uh, how he was kind of kind of wacky. Like he was he was being Marlon Brando essentially. Well, this but. is Marlon Brando at his at his Marlon Brando est, you know, in, in, in at the end of like the end of not even at the end of his career. He didn't lie, he didn't die until 2000, 
three or something, but um, this is him at his like laziest. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, because I mean, let's face it, he he was lazy at this point. I mean, <laughs> he lazy. put in a great performance in The Godfather, but like you you've seen the pictures of like you know uh, those back behind the scenes photos of freaking. Um, Robert Duvall, like, with a cue card taped to his chest so that Marlon Brando could, like, read the cue card off of him, right? Like, right. It, 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 I mean, he was um, – so before – real quick. So Dick Donner was uh, was hired as the director. Richard Donner was hired as director after the Salkind saw uh, The Omen and thought he was a good fit, um, which is odd because The Omen is a, the opposite of this film. <laughs> um but uh, but Donner um, wanted uh, wanted to get uh, Brando. He wanted a name uh, for for the Jor-El character, and uh, if it, you know Brando at this point, who's barely working, you know at this point, you know after Godfather and uh, and Last Tango in Paris, you know he wasn't really doing a lot, so he really had to be convinced, uh, and uh, so basically he. He got convinced for a lot of money, so he uh, so he he basically went over to his house, flattered him, uh, and he agreed to make the movie for four million dollars, which was huge at that point, and twelve percent of the box office. Twelve percent of the uh, box office. Come on, office. bro. Come on. As I mean, say. <laughs> I mean, the movie made uh, I think in in nineteen seventy eight. I think it made like three hundred some million dollars. So he he walked out of that movie with about thirty five million dollars. So. Um, yeah, <laughs> but despite all that, uh, he refused. He said he he needed to be. He could only work twelve days, and he refused to learn his lines. And he even tr- this is pro- I think this is what you're referring to. He even tried to convince Donner that hey, it's an alien, so doesn't know what people look like, right? Maybe we can just put up a green bagel that talks. <laughs> Bro, I'm trying a to green figure out- bagel. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out which Brando was lazier, bro. Fucking this one or Apocalypse Now Brando. Because that was a lazy Brando, too. That was a really lazy Brando. I think Apocalypse <laughs> Now may have been his laziest, though. So, so, okay, so we just said two minutes ago that Superman was his laziest, and now we're changing Yeah, no, story. it may be Apocalypse Now. It may be Apocalypse <laughs> Now. Uh, but, yeah, he... he um. You know, despite that, he did deliver a good performance. He did. He I did. Mean, we got to say. I mean, it was earnest. He didn't treat it. He didn't. You know, it's funny because well, a lot of times when you have movies like this um, and you have like a serious, a quote unquote serious actor in a comic book movie, they, they really ham it up. And and this is what, which is what Gene Hackman does in this film. But it, yeah. it works. His performance works in this movie. But um so, so you kind of expect Brando to be a little hammy, but he's not. He's actually very earnest, even though he's wearing this like very seventies like white uh, trench coat with the Superman symbol on it, um, but, and it looks very silly and cheesy. But uh, he, he's very earnest, and the, he's actually more earnest, I think, in the the scenes in the fortress where he's talking to uh, where he's talking to Clark, um, and you see more of those in the extended editions. But but in, but he does still talk to like the young Clark at. Uh, um, uh, in those scenes as well, and he's a lot more earnest right. than that in, in those as well. Right, right. And the other thing that that I found wacky just from the beginning, um, and, and this is uh, this is even before we get to Krypton, is that uh, Marlon Brando, of course, because Marlon Brando and Gene Hackman, because he's Gene Hackman, they got. They got top, top billing, billing, yeah. Before before the title, bro. <laughs> so Christopher Reeve didn't even get the, the pre-title top billing, bro. That's kind of that's kind of messed up. It, it's like uh, Jack Nicholson and, and and Batman. Although I think at least Michael Keaton got above the title billing in that. One. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> like, Christopher, least... it's like Marlon Brando, Gene Hackman, Superman, also Christopher Reeve, and then Christopher. <laughs> <Reeve>. <laughs> And even Margot Kidder was like tenth from the top yeah. <laughs> post post title, so yeah. that was wacky too. <laughs> and she was like in most of the second half of the movie. So, but I mean, it makes sense though because Christopher Reeve was an unknown. He he was uh, absolutely like I don't think he'd done anything up in this point up to this point. Um, it, it was all uh, I mean, those were the two big gets of the film. Um, so they were so they did a long casting process. Speaking of of, of this uh, for for Superman. Because you kind of had to have someone who looked the part, who could who could act, and who could also be you know a physical presence themselves. Um, and I have a wacky list of people that were considered here, which I think is oh, I love these lists because I remember when I do retrospectives too on perspective, and I get you the wacky list 
of who tried out for what. I, I'm okay. I'm I'm ready. So, bro. So, here I'm ready are, to laugh. so here are some of them. I'm ready Cl- to laugh, bro. Clint Eastwood. Okay. <laughs> Which okay. All right. I mean, he was an action star. Okay. Not not quite what we're thinking about, but okay. Um, Dustin Hoffman. No, bro. Oh, God. Can you imagine? Ugh. <laughs> oh, it gets better. Uh, Al Pacino. Well, you know I have a soft spot for that guy, so <laughs> I'll picture a Tony Montana in a Superman outfit. <laughs> uh, Bruce Jenner. Why, bro? <laughs> he was an Olympic athlete. He had the body, right? Who can- <laughs> uh, uh, I guess. Uh, James Kahn. Okay. I can see Connie, bro. <laughs> This one was purely for the body. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh, God. Can, can, you, imagine? Can, you, can you imagine? Can you imagine? And <laughs> I can't even, like, this one just cracks me up. Muhammad Ali. What? Uh, yeah. Oh. I, I can't. And and then there was one, and so they had so much trouble casting this that they were got at one point they were so desperate they even um, they even auditioned one of the Saul kinds as dentists. I'm not joking. <laughs> I don't know what the guy's name was. He wasn't really an actor, but like they, if you if you have any of the DVDs or Blu-rays and you look at some of the making ofs, uh, they have a uh, uh, they have a some screen some screen test footage of this dorky looking dude in a Superman outfit like testing out for the for the part. Clearly, he didn't get it. Um, I forget wow. how they landed on Reeve, uh, but they eventually did go with Reeve, who was an unknown at the time. And it's funny because if you watch some of his test footage, uh, you can tell that like it's the costume either wasn't like ready yet or uh, or what because it was just it was a little like ill fitting, and then you could see like the pit stains, you know, in the costume from from sweating right. under the lights, which is kind of funny. Um, but yeah, so they went with Christopher Reeve, and um, thankfully, thankfully so, in my opinion. Oh yeah, I mean when when we really start talking about him in this movie it's just uh, i think they couldn't have found someone that really embodies what superman is and just is able to just be that charming that charming guy you know who (laughs) who is who uh who what am i trying to say here it's so i think what we want to touch on too is that you know he can be like this charming you know Let's just say superhero because I can't even think of a better word for it. Like it's just charming, you know, macho superhero. But at the same time, be so different and dorky and nerdy as Clark Kent to just avoid suspicion completely from other people. And and, and you buy it. So that, so that's just that's, – that's probably his greatest trigger to be able to differentiate the Clark and the Superman performance and make it believable. And that's the thing is is that you're, you're absolutely right and that's why he's always – he's the best one. Um, cause I mean, when you look at all the famous Superman, you know, uh, George Reeves was basically the same guy the whole time. And he, he <laughs> it turns out he hated that part anyway. Yeah. Um, Brandon Routh, as I said, he was, uh, a, 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 he's, he did more of an impression. Henry, Henry Cavill, eh, you know, he actually got it kind of right in the last movie in, in that Justice League movie. He kind of got it right in that movie, but really just the Superman part, not anything else. Um, but no one has really ever done it like Christopher Reeve, where he it's a, it's a two part role. It's you playing two different parts. Chris Clark Kent is a different character than Superman than Kal El, and he's the he he's one of the only actors that is actually he's the only actor that's ever gotten that with that role. He's the only one. Um, and we've said this too, and with just not just with Superman, but with other. Superhero. I mean, they, I think Spider Man was the more notorious one that we like to talk about, where they just can't seem to get the Peter Parker Spider Man, you know, combo. Oh yeah, they they, t- right. they totally keep messing it up. Like the Tobey Maguire was was perfect as Peter Parker, but a horrible Spider Man. And then uh, Andrew Garfield was a good Spider Man, but a terrible Peter Parker. Um, Tom Holland's got got it mostly. He's got a. He still think needs a little more work on his Spidey, but I think he's got it. He think he's almost got it. Yeah, but but again, you're su- we're supposed to buy that you know these guys are trying to protect themselves, their identities, so they need to make their public selves d- 
different to avoid suspicion, you know? And it's, I mean, it's easier for Spider-Man and people like that because they wear full costumes. Superman has his face exposed. And it's like, it, it always found it kind of ridiculous that Superman all had to do was just put on a pair of glasses and he's a different guy, you know? And no one will recognize him. But, uh, but the fact that, you know, Reed plays them so differently, you buy that the pair of glasses kind of hides him well because his demeanor and everything changes. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's dumb because you look at the costume and, yeah, you're like, yeah, it's silly that you, nobody can recognize him and stuff. Uh, and they play with that in, in the second movie. But, it, I mean, it is – it really is. If you put them side by side, the performances side by side, he, it is such – I mean, it's not just a like a. It's not just a performance of like how he's like talking or anything. It's a physical performance too. He's a little more hunched over. He's like very right. clumsy. You know, he he's just he's such a an unforgivable dork that yeah. it, you know, it, like it's uh, and it, it's so perfect. Um, you know, it reminds me of the um, uh, and I read it. I wrote it down because I want to read some of it. It reminds me of the Kill Bill two speech. Right where he goes, um, where uh, where um, Bill at the very end of the movie talk, is talking to Uma Thurman, and he, right. sa- he says, uh, "Superman didn't become Superman. Superman was born Superman. When Superman wakes up in the morning, he's Superman. His alter ego is Clark Kent. Uh, his outfit with the big red S—that's the blanket he was wrapped in as a baby. Those are his clothes. What Kent wears: the glasses, the business suits. That's the costume. The costume Superman wears to blend in with us. Clark Kent is how Superman views us." And what and what are the characteristics of Clark Kent? He's weak. He's unsure of himself. He's a coward. Um, and that that is, I mean, leave it to Tarantino to to, to sum it up best, right? Yeah. That's exactly what he is. Like that, that's how that's how Christopher Reeves plays him. And that to me, I think, is why um, that to me is why uh, no one has ever gotten that role right better than than Christopher Reeve. Oh, absolutely. Like we said, you know, the the fact that he's able to just distinguish those two characters, even though they're the same person, he's able to make it believable that Clark Kent can never be Superman. I mean, th- th- this this little coward who <laughs> fainted. <laughs> I love that scene where she where Lois comes up to him after you know the 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 the, the mugger runs off and she thinks that he's been shot and he says, "Oh, I think I must have fainted." And that look she gives him like this little pussy, bro. <laughs> I mean, but but it's because Reeve makes that work, bro. And that's what I, I mean. That's one of my favorite scenes, just because of how like he's able, like he just he he goes all in on that Clark Kent character and that scene, and that that establishes him for like for, for Lois and for everybody else for the rest of the movie. And it's and it's awesome. It's, it's a great performance. Yeah. And speaking of Margot Kidder, um. The, it's casting another sort of unknown. She she had done some work before. I think the most notable thing she was in was in um, was in Sisters. I think the Brian De Palma film uh, from a few years earlier, and she was also in Black Christmas. Right. Um, but she, for the most part, she had not done a ton of. She wasn't like a household name. Um, they they. This is another kind of odd list. Not as not as wacky as uh, not as wacky as the um, uh. as the Clark Kent one. But they they uh, they they. Um, they auditioned uh, Ann Archer, Susan Blakely, Leslie Ann Warren, Deborah Raffin, and Stocker Channing uh, before they finally. That's wacky, one, yeah. Uh, yeah, but it's not as wacky as freaking Arnold and Muhammad Ali. That's and, true. You know, you know what I mean? Uh, no, but but like... thinking about but thinking about Rizzo as freaking uh, as freaking Lois Lane, that's kind of yeah, wacky. It is a little wacky, but uh, it, it's uh, but they finally set on Lois Lane or on Margot Kidder, um, which I think she really works in this film. She has that kind of. Um, Smart Alec kind of sensibility that Lois Lane is supposed to have, but she's also um, she can also be you know the vulnerable damsel in distress that you know, uh, which maybe not may not the most progressive thing in the world, and you know, and in future movies and the comics, she's a lot more she's a lot less damsel in distress and a lot more you know uh, progressive in in getting her agenda you know taken care of. Um, but in this movie, she works. Um, she obviously she has the best line. Uh, one of the best lines in the movie, whenever she's like, who's got, you got me, who's got you? Um, <laughs> that's a good one. But she, but I mean, that's, that's one of the, you know, that's, that's one of the uh, defining lines of the film, right? Um, but yeah, the, she, she really works. With, and and what's even more important is that, um, you know, we recently talked about, um, 
you know, on Force Perspective, we recently talked about uh, uh, Red Sparrow and the, the the lack of chemistry between Jennifer uh, Jennifer Lawrence and uh, Joel Edgerton. Whereas here, Margot complete Kidder, complete opposite, yeah, complete, complete opposite. opposite. Margot Kidder I and Chris Reeve have have real chemistry in this film. The way, dude, I love that scene so much because just the way the way she talks to him in that scene. On the rooftop, where she, where she just asking them these questions, all of a sudden she just starts drifting lazily into the hole. So does that mean your other bodily functions work? <laughs> and you know, she's implying sex, but they make it so coy and so so subtle enough that uh, that you know it kind of gets by. And then he goes, you know, she goes like, "Do you, do you get hungry?" Yeah. Well, oh, no, no. She goes like, "Do you eat?" Yeah, I eat when I'm hungry, you know. And then when when she gets up and he follows her, like Superman, kind of he doesn't wink, but he gives that kind of suggestive look to the camera, like, "Yeah, I get hungry. All right, I'm hungry right now." And that's pretty awesome, bro. Just and but it but it works because of the the two actors' chemistry together. It's just it's so great, and you you could just. Like the heat comes off the screen, and well, I felt I, I, it was awesome. I mean, I mean, the best part of that, the best example of that, I think, is whenever, um, you know, earlier in the interview, she's she's like, "Oh, you have X-ray vision. What color uh, color underwear am I wearing?" And he can't tell because of the lead in front of the in front of the yeah. And, but then later she walks by and he goes, "Pink." She goes, "What? Uh, pink." And, and and she goes, "Oh, do you like pink? Like pink?" And she's like, "I like pink very much, love." Very much. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Come on." Like the, the, that's chemistry right there. You don't that's have awesome, like, bro. You, like you feel it. Like it it radiates off the screen no yeah, matter where those, you're watching it. Those two actually have chemistry. Uh, and 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 if it's, that didn't it's work, a little hot in here, bro. <laughs> if if that didn't work, it would that that relationship wouldn't have worked. Mm. Exactly, and it just speaks to the just the the performances and just the skill from those two actors. And they, like you said, they just made it work. Um. So that, that's kind of a lot of the background I have on the film. Um, so basically, the the, the film uh, we we start off on the planet Krypton with Krypton, uh, bro, with uh, Marlon Brando uh, as Jor El, uh, basically um, uh, sentencing uh, General Zod and his two cronies uh, to death in the fan, not death, but to imprisonment in the in the Phantom Zone. Uh, and the reason that they uh, they did this is because they were actually filming Superman one and two at the same time, right. um, which is one of the, I think the earliest examples of them doing that. It's interesting that they knew that they were going to already make a sequel uh, ahead of time, but. Uh, so they they were going to film both of them at the same time, and uh, as let you know, and this eventually they they after filming like seventy five percent of Superman two, they were kind of coming up on a deadline on Superman one, so they just decided, all right, we got to finish Superman one, we'll we'll finish Superman two later, and that's whenever Richard Dunner got fired and Richard Lester got uh... brought in, and then that's why Superman two is so. Kind of different, but we'll which get... I'm hoping is on your essential films Tumblr or well, the random film generator because that's that's a huge that that, that backstory for for Superman two is this, that could that could be a two parter. Right? Yeah, I mean, and, and also the you also had the the Richard Donner cut which came out like years later too. Was so right. it's a whole thing. But anyway, yeah. so that's why you you have this this teaser here at the beginning of Superman one with General Zod screaming, "One day you'll bow down before me." Uh, but it, it's also. Um, it's a teaser for Superman too, which I think is kind of really interestingly forward thinking, considering that that they knew, hey, we're gonna make a second one, and here's the teaser for it at the beginning of the movie, not at the end. Yeah, I found that interesting too, especially uh, you go if you watch all the way to the end of the credits. You know, I'm, I'm jumping ahead, but it te- it says right there next year Superman two. So I was like, oh. So, I mean, probably pe- at this point, people never stay for the credits anyway in the theater. People still don't do that. But um, I can't imagine, like, people I – mean, there was anybody in there still in, in the 70s. And uh, so they missed the little next year Superman 2 teaser at the end of the credits. So I was like, oh, that's – they already they, – they gave that away already. That's kind of cool. Um, but th- it started with this whole scene on Krypton. Or, <laughs> and now I'm saying it the right way. A Krypton, bro. I got to say Krypton, bro. And uh, and uh, our boy General Zod getting put in the Phantom Zone. And uh, But that just makes it when you see Superman 2 and you're like, oh, it's those guys. Oh. And then it just it just makes it just makes it all make sense. And it makes the everything just even better, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> um, 
So then um, we have uh, we we get to the kind of like the origin part of it, where where Jor El's talking around with like the council, uh, whatever you call them, the council on on on, on Krypton, uh, and and he basically says, "Look, the planet's going to blow up. They don't want to believe him, and they're just saying, oh, it's just shifting into orbit.' Which, by the way, sounds kind of disastrous in and of itself. Um, but it's just shifting into orbit. It's okay. Um, and uh, Jor El's like, "All right, fine. We're, my wife and I aren't going to leave." Which, which really means, obviously, he's going to send his son out uh, off, off the planet, which is what he does. Um, he, he, <laughs> Bro, I hate to, to, to interrupt you, but <laughs> it's just, I just had an epiphany, bro. <laughs> but poor, poor Joe Earl, bro, trying to tell these people the planet's going to blow up. <laughs> and, and, and within 30 days, Kryp- Krypton will be no more. And all they're, and all they're saying to him is the fake Krypton media is saying the planet's going to blow up. Oh, my gosh. It's all true. fake news. Yeah, it's the true. fake news, people. <laughs> it's not going to blow up. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I just had that epiphany, bro. There you go. Krypton's blowing up. Fake news. <laughs> fake news. <laughs> anyway, um, so there you go. Uh, so the you know Jor El puts puts the baby in the in, in the in the uh, in the little spaceship there. Uh, he talks. He actually says a little bit here how the 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 atmosphere and the gravitational pull of Earth and the the yellow sun are, are going to actually give him powers. Um, and then, you know, obviously he sends him off and the Krypton explodes. And uh, then we get kind of like a 2001 A Space Odyssey sequence <laughs> of a uh, little oh. Kal-El in the spaceship as uh, all these kind of colors fly around. Uh, and then he crash lands on in Kansas. Right, right. And I kind of like uh, I kind of like the, the whole. Well, I like also well, I, I'm, I'm jumping ahead, but. Man of Steel did the I, their, their Krypton scene was what like about forty minutes it felt like I think, um, and they went into a lot of a lot of story on that one. Here I think they did about what it was like fifteen minutes that whole uh, Krypton sequence, mm-hmm. and it pretty much told the same exact story in a, in a more efficient manner than in Man of Steel did. But that's a whole other monster for another yeah, day. Yeah, in Man of Steel, like, they he, they gave freaking Russell Crowe a whole action sequence. <laughs> He's and, riding uh, around on the dragon, bro. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what we want to see. No. Did that dragon look better or worse than one from A Wrinkle in Time? No, Man of Steel, <laughs> hands down, brother, hands down. But, but unfortunately, we don't get Marlon Brando riding a dragon, but... uh. We see people fall into their deaths here, which is which is wacky. And uh, but I mean, again, there was a more efficient way. Of, I mean, it told the same story, but I mean, they crunched it down to 15 minutes and said the exact same thing. So I got to give uh, our boy Donner credit for that. But it was it was an inter- oh, uh, I love how it was shot with, you know, with they kind of had the people falling down and like it, it, it had that sense of dread to it. And I was like, oh, I, can't, I mean, they were kind of stupid for not believing Joel, but I feel bad for them now. <laughs> so. But yeah, but we see the little little Kal-El flying through space, learning the history of a whole galaxy. That, that's what I kind of found weird too, and I don't know if, if you felt the same way. But so, in that whole sequence, like you know, he's learning about Einstein, he's learning about the Chinese, and it's like this is a whole separate galaxy, and Jora knows about Chinese people, and he knows about Einstein. That's it's kind of well, weird. It, it's I mean, in the I mean, it's kind of like in they they touched upon this in Man of Steel too, where like they. They've always been like travelers, and they know about like other cultures and other planets and stuff like that. So they bring back that kind of knowledge. Um, it, it's it, they touched on it in the comics as well. I think uh, someone can correct me if I'm wrong. So there is other reasons as to why that, it, but they don't really go into it in the movie. You're right. They're just kind of like, yeah, I know about. Yeah, we know about what or what's going on on Earth. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so he crash lands on Kansas. Uh, Jonathan and Martha Kent, played by a. Uh, Jonathan can played by Glenn Ford, old school, old school Hollywood Woo! actor, um, uh, who, who if, just random, random shout out to one of his movies. Uh, you should watch if you've never seen Gilda. You should watch Gilda. That's a great movie. Um, oh, I, I I have the Criterion Blu-ray. Yeah, he's the lead, yeah, he's awesome. the lead in that movie. But um, awesome well, him and Rita Hayworth. But um, oh, Rita Hayworth, uh, talk it's getting a little hot in here again, bro. <laughs> but uh, they they find uh, they find the the. Uh, they find the spaceship, and uh, uh, they kind of say, well, you know, or Martha really says, well, we never had kids, and, and we ne- we're never able to have kids. We can say that this is a 
one of our cousin's kids from wherever and we were adopted him which couldn't fly in 2018 by the way no you way bro. there's like no way you could you could uh you could be like oh yeah this is my cousin's kid and then people would want to see paperwork yeah. <laughs> um, but uh as he's changing a tire you know the the truck almost falls on top of him and then little little three-year-old clark uh uh or at this point cal i guess uh holds up the uh, holds up the truck and they realize oh this little kid has superpowers all right then all righty, <laughs> exactly right. Of course, then, of course, it's the seventies, so they had to show us little tiny baby penis for, for no reason. Oh, uh, yeah, that 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 was. I, a little I could disturbing. do without that, but you know, that was a little disturbing. Yeah, but then, uh, <laughs> but then, that, but then, but then, I'm sure you're going to go into this, but they they from right there they jump immediately into high school Clark Kent. Like, there's no in between. Like, you get the you get him to look in the truck, and then all of a sudden he's a senior in high school. Yeah, and uh, he's a dork, and he's uh, he's 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 not on the football team. He's in the uh, he's like the the equipment manager, basically. Uh, he's getting picked on by all the jocks, and um, you know he's got a crush on one of the cheerleaders. But then you know he's you know one of them. I think the cheerleader asks Lana asks him out, and he's like, "Oh yeah," but then the other jocks like, "Oh, you haven't finished up uh, with all your work." And then they show that all the work he had just done, they just they just threw all over the ground because they're jerks. Um, so yeah. they, yeah, they Lana go, Lang, yeah, yeah, who came more into prominence in, in the Smallville series, but we did see her, I believe, in Superman three. Is that we correct? We did see her in Superman three, yeah, with yeah. Uh, Annette O'Toole. Uh, Ironically to, enough, yes. Yeah. Um, so then, uh, you know, they go, they the the teenagers run off, and then obviously Clark has super speed, so he he collects everything up, but not before kicking the football into outer space, um, because we need to see that. Uh, and then he runs home, races a train, and runs home and beats beats the teenagers to to his house. Um, one quick bit of trivia: uh, as he's passing the train, there's a, an older couple in the train uh, with right. a young Lois Lane for, uh, and she's like, "Look, I saw a man running or whatever." That old couple, uh, the man was uh, Kirk Allen, the original Superman from the '40s, and the <laughs> uh, and the uh, woman Noel Neal. Uh, Noel Neal, who was the original Lois Lane from the uh, TV series, um, and Bo- and by the way, Noel Neal did make an appearance in Superman Returns too. Uh, she was the old woman at the end that Lex Luthor conned out of her money. Oh, oh nice! That that's awesome. <laughs> so uh, little little homage to the uh, little homage to the uh, to the old school there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so. Uh, Glenn Ford, um, Jonathan Kent sees uh, sees Clark showing off, so he's like, "Hey, you know, son, you weren't here for for playing football and and you know showing off your powers. You were here for a reason. I don't know what it is, but you were here for a reason." And shortly after, he dies of a heart attack. Yeah, um, well, I don't mean to laugh, but it's like I've served my purpose in this film. I'm telling you what you're here to do, and now I'm gone. <laughs> you know? Yeah, at least John Schneider took five seasons before he died. He, uh, <laughs> Glenn Ford died in like two minutes. Not for nothing, but I was upset when John Schneider died. Oh man, that 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 was oh that was probably the peak of that show, bro. Yeah, that like, was the peak it, of the show. I think that was the peak of the show. Yeah. Um. And then uh, shortly after the funeral, uh, Clark, when Clark kind of becomes a man, he gets a calling. Uh, and it's uh, he he goes to the to where his parents have had had buried the spaceship, and he finds a green crystal. A lot of people think that's kryptonite. It's not kryptonite. It's just a green crystal. Um, and he he for he kind of instinctively knows he has to take it north. Uh, he takes it north. He throws it into the ocean, and it makes the uh, the fortress of solitude. The solitude. Yep. Which is this big crystal fortress uh, that they actually replicated again on Smallville. Um, and uh, in that fortress, he, he sees a, a like a hologram of of Brando, and ba- Brando basically says, "All right, this is who you are. You're an alien, and uh, you've got these powers, and I'm going to teach you how to use these powers for the greater good of mankind." Yeah, and apparently, it takes twelve years to learn all that stuff. Yep, twelve so. years, <laughs> um, and uh, and he comes back when he's thirty, and so now. So he now he's on the scene as Clark Kent. This is where we kind of start to pick up the story. This is like, uh, would you say this is Act Two or Act? Three? Well, it's weird because I, you know I kind of saw it as Krypton was Act One, uh, 
teenage Clark Kent was at Act Two up until Metropolis, and then Metropolis onward is like technically Act Three because that's when all this shit happens anyway. So, but I mean, you can kind of even go, you can kind of arrange it a little differently. You could even maybe say it's a four act, four act film, but uh, but that'd be kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so well, this is where like the meat of the movie takes place. Um, yeah, Superman or sorry, Clark uh, goes to goes to Metropolis to get a job. And this is where you see him in his full on dorkiness. Because the first, uh, the first, uh, at the beginning, it was like another actor who played Clark, uh, whose name is escaping me. But actually, I believe Christopher Reeve dubbed his voiceover, um, so it's not actually that ca- character's uh, character's voice in, the, in those early scenes. Um, oh. But uh, so we finally see Clark in his full dorkiness with like the glasses and the hat and the suit and the hunched shoulders, and he can't open the soda for 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 Perry White and. Uh, and he's just a complete and utter tool, basically. <laughs> um, and uh, he get he gets a job at the Daily Planet, working with Lois. Uh, tries to hit on Lois, and he miserably fails um, many and, times. Uh, many times. And then finally, um, uh, you know, as he's leaving the the planet for the day, uh, they get that scene that you like where they get mugged, and he <laughs> and he faints. He fades, <laughs> and Lois like gives him that 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 what a beta look, and walks away. But we re- we find out that Superman caught the bullet that the mugger shot at him. So good on him. <laughs> but I like that. It's like, oh gee, Lois, it must have fainted, fainted. <laughs> and, then she, and then she gives him that look, bro. That 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 she just lost complete respect in, in that man look, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that that the look that you never want to see from a woman. So, <laughs> um, so later, uh, a little bit later on, uh, you know, Lois has to go on a, on a helicopter to um, to cover some story. I don't remember what it is. And uh, get the the helicopter has a mechanical problem. It starts crashing and it, it starts to go down. And of course, this is when we finally and finally see Superman. Full shot of Superman in all his glory. They even kind of throw a little bit of a joke in there because you see Clark running to a phone booth, but it's kind of one of those open phone booths, so he can't change in there. So he, yeah. runs, so he kind of just runs across the street and opens the, the iconic shot of him opening up his, his shirt and revealing the logo underneath. Uh, and then <laughs> he's, uh, he starts flying up and you get the guy going, Say, hey, man, that's a bad outfit. Yeah, well, he starts flying and that shut that guy up, bro. <laughs> It was probably supposed to be a pimp or something. I think it's, it's it is seventies New York. Yeah, I so. think that's definitely supposed to be a pimp. Well, it's even though okay, Metropolis, but uh, even though come it's on, li- literally New York. Whenever they fly around the Statue of Liberty and the World Trade Center, but whatever. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> but um, so uh, this is where we get the famous line where Lois falls out and he catches her and he goes, "Blacksmith, I've got you." And she goes, "You've got me. Who's got you?" And then the whole rest. Of, then you get basically like a mo- not a montage. But like a ten minute sequence of different of him basically showing off his power. So like yeah. it's it's a way for the audience to be like, okay, this is how this is how his powers work. This is how he this is what he does, and this is like how he's going to be dedicating his life from now on. Yeah, I mean it's it's a nice sequence because you get you get the feel for what Superman is and what uh what his again you know he's showing off his powers like what he can do and. I think this was a nice setup for just the character because you, you – OK, you've already seen him rescue Lois. OK, that's one thing. But then you see him – OK, he catches bank robbers and jewel thieves. He res- And then <laughs> all the way from that up to rescuing cats from trees. Like that's just super bad. He's the epitome of truth, justice, the American way, the epitome of goodness as we find out later on when he talks to Lois on the roof. But you start getting – the feel for that and you start seeing that in action with this sequence that's why i like it it just it, it just it's character building you know yeah it, it's it's character building and it's um it's a display of his powers you can see how like how strong he truly is you know because he can he, he you know uh, he helps like land the plane the air force one i think it's air of course it's air force one right um yeah it, he helps land air force one so you know he's strong uh he, he can fly you know he's got uh uh, and you know that he's got, um, and he's, he still has time to, like you said, rescue cats from trees. Um, and uh, even though, 
the freaking uh, the freaking little girl goes in. She's like, "Mommy, oh, a man flew girl. down." And she goes, "Slap! Stop telling lies." Uh, he's, yeah. <laughs> that's the se- that's the seventies for you. Yeah. <laughs> um. So all the while, by the way, we keep getting little flashbacks to uh, Lex Luthor. A little kind of cut in between all this. Uh, so Lex Luthor. He's got like an underground lair. He's got like this bumbling idiot named Otis with him, and uh, Valley Perrine as Miss Tessmacher, uh, whose whose boobs are basically always out. Um, and um, he, he he keeps uh you know he he sees um the uh, the news footage of Superman, and he's like something's up with this guy. I want to know what's going on with him. And and he he kind of deduces that that. Through basically no real yeah, I was gonna say like, it was kind evidence. of it was kind of weird how <laughs> how he just came up with it or figured it out that he's from another you know well I mean he does Superman does say in the interview with Lois Lane that he's from another planet but he kind of just figures out well it must be this this meteorite that hit Addis Ababa <laughs> um, oh and, and when speaking of that bro when uh, when he says uh, when, when you know that you talked about that scene where you know oh I can't see through lead so like you couldn't see you know Lois's underwear right. <laughs> So, um, so he, when he tells her, "Oh, I can't see through lead," and she writes it down, like I'm like, "Don't print that. <laughs> you, you shouldn't be telling people that he can't see through lead because then the bad guys are going to use that to their advantage, like Lex Luthor did in the, in the in later on." But we'll get to that later. But it's like you know, some of the stuff in that interview they probably shouldn't even print it to begin with because that probably just ended up helping Lex figure out his weakness. Right. But anyway, um, yeah, exactly. But yeah, so. Well, we actually just kind of skip over that. She does interview him, and that's when they go on that flight that we mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, and then that's where they get all that information, basically, Lex Luthor uses uh, to his advantage. Um, so they they don't show it in the movie, but they basically go they, – they, they, it's implied that they go to Addis Ababa to steal a um, – no, they don't go to Addis Ababa. They go to a museum to steal some meteorite, basically. Right. Um, uh, which is ends up being kryptonite. Yeah. Um. And then we kind of fast forward a little bit after after he's been uh, after he's been you know saving and he's been out in the world and saving people. Uh, we we see a little bit more of Lex Luthor's plan as he kind of starts. And, and some, I mean, this is where the movie gets really goofy, right? Because there's no way any of this would ever actually in a movie where 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 a guy can a guy from another planet can fly. This is the most unbelievable aspect of it, where <laughs> where Lex Luthor is able to like con the army uh, into like reprogramming its missiles, you know, which is like okay, I'll, I'll buy it for this movie, but come on now, you know what I mean? Um, so the whole se- there's a whole sequence where Otis and Miss Testmarker reprogram the missiles. Although Otis screws it up first, and then Miss Testmark uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Miss uh, Miss Testmarker has to do it herself later. Um, I, I set the first vector to you know I, I don't know what it was like fourteen. The second one to seven. No, no, the second one to thirty two, and the third one to to one seventeen. What about the fourth one? What fourth one? <laughs> the- Otis. You're supposed to set the third one to eleven and the fourth one to seven. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Mister Luther Otis. <laughs> and he starts strangling him, bro. <laughs> that, I love that part. That part's wacky. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's funny though because so we'll talk about Gene Hackman here. The guy, you know, Lex Luthor the character was never really that wacky. Lex Luthor the character is a lot more. If you ever watch like the Superman cartoon or the Justice League cartoon, yeah. that's really what more, more what Lex Luthor is, is like. He's much more of like the calculating businessman, um, actually, or Smallville. He's much more like that. Like, oh yeah, like he's so a cal- we we want more Michael Rosenbaum and less Jesse Eisenberg. Is what you're saying? <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> um. He's he's a calculating businessman. He he's very he's very um, uh, he's not very witty and he he's he's much more ruthless. Um, and and they do show like that he's a that this Lex Luthor is ruthless. He's certainly willing to kill people, um, but he's really he's really hammy in this film. And you know, as a purist, you think that would bother me, but it doesn't because he's so entertaining in the film that it doesn't bother me that he's not like he's supposed to be. Well, that's because he doesn't talk about Jolly Ranchers at all. 
So well, that's true. It actually bothered me more with Kevin Spacey in in Superman Returns because he was he was like doing a Gene Hackman impression in that movie. I I thought that uh, you know it's funny. I don't know if I mentioned this on the in the when, when we buried this movie, but I thought Jesse Eisenberg was trying to be Gene Hackman with the wackiness. He just he took too. it way too far. Yeah, you know? yeah, I think it, I think he was too. He it was just like, no, dude, you're not doing it right. No, <laughs> you know, you you you're, you're doing it way way too way way wackier than Gene Hackman did, and it, and it's killing the the performance. <laughs> he's he's having it up way too much. Then, but no, but but Hackman found that balance in a way. Yeah, and, and and you know it's funny because he is so like he does have like goofy moments throughout the film, but then when he like has when he does things where like you know he's so all right so let's fast forward. Yes, so, he, he has exposition scenes that come off you know really well. Yeah, because it, it, it you're you established already in the movie that this guy's. Pretty intelligent. Well, I mean, he kills that one cop in the subway, right? Yeah. Like pretty, like pretty much right away. That's your kind of introduction to him. Like you, you're told, like it's a like through kind of like I think Perry White mentioned this, like oh, some people broke into a museum and killed killed some guards over a meteorite. Uh, so yeah. you know that was him, um, right? And then so when he traps Superman, first of all, he like lures him to the to his underground lair with like a frequency only he can hear, mm-hmm. uh, and then uh, bef- and then basically. Um, as when Superman breaks into his his lair, he kind of lays out his whole plot. He like tells him, "This is the this is what I'm gonna do." Like so, he's he's kind of like a reverse Bond villain, right? Like a Bond yeah. villain traps the guy and then tells him the plan. Where he's like, "I'm gonna tell you the plan right away. This is what I'm gonna do, and then I'm gonna kill you." Right? Um, which I think is kind of. I mean, he does make the classic mistake of walking away before real before making sure he's dead, like yeah. all villains do. But he's still like. But so he, he, his his plan is that he's he's taking the missiles. One's going to New Jersey. One's going to the San Andreas Fault. He can't stop both the missiles, and the San Andreas Fault is gonna when it hits the San Andreas Fault, it's gonna sink California into the ocean, and um uh. And basically, he's gonna buy a whole. He's gonna have a whole bunch of beachfront property that's under his name. Um, he tells him this, knowing that Superman's not gonna stop him because he's got kryptonite hidden away in a uh, in a in a lead safe that he found out because Lois Lane printed in the stupid article. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but I love I love this sequence because whenever he's he's uh, uh, he's showing sh- showing Superman the map, he's like, "Here's Casa del Lex," and then. Otisburg. Otisburg. <laughs> Otisburg. <laughs> that was that was that, that that was a that was a nice touch that they did there. <laughs> no, but but the thing that that trips me out is that I don't know who wrote that part. If it was Puzo or whoever, any of the of the co writers, but who picked Hackensack, New Jersey? That's such a random town, man. And I'm uh, as a New Jersey, and I'm telling you. Hackensack is so insignificant that it's that, that's like that's their only claim to fame that they were about to get blown up in the movie Superman. Like legit, there's nothing else fascinating about Hackensack in the least. So the fact that I hear Hackensack, New Jersey, is a target from Lex Luthor to get blown up, it trips me out because Hackensack is so not special, and it's just it's just wacky, you know. And I know I've been saying a lot of things are wacky about this movie, but but it's just true. Like there's the only one, the only way to describe it is just wacky. And picking Hackensack, New Jersey, as a target for terrorism is wacky to me. So I have to think that like it was probably like some writers, like some writer had a connection to that to Hackensack. Like had to be, like had like, to like, like he grew up there or something. Like there's a, like otherwise you're right. Why would they? Why would they pick that? Exactly. Um. So yeah, so he tells him the whole evil plan, then traps him with the with the kryptonite, uh, which Superman did at that point did not know kryptonite was even a thing and could hurt him. Um, so, uh, but then he makes the mistake of like walking away before realizing he's dead. He throws him yeah. into a pool where he's you know starts to drown, um, <laughs> and I love how how Miss Miss Tessmacher goes, but Lex, my mother lives in Hackensack, and he just kind of looks at his watch and just shakes his head. <laughs> Like oh well, <laughs> and he has that line where it was like, "Is this how your sick mind works by uh, uh, by planning the death of e- 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 millions of innocent people?" He's like, "No, by causing the death of millions of innocent people." <laughs> like, see, and that's the thing. Like at that point where he's like truly evil, like, and he's, he's you show him that he's kind of this maniac. 
even though he's been this goofy this goof throughout the whole film he still comes off as menacing in this in this portion right here because a he shows you that he's got this evil plan to kill him, millions of people but also he he's he he beat superman he he beat him and he he trapped him and, and he basically almost killed him um if if miss Tessbacher hadn't helped out like he'd be dead right but she made him promise, yeah. like, if I'm going to help you, you got to save Hackensack <laughs> so first. So that's – well, that, we'll get to that now. But that's what eventually leads to the climax of what he has to do now to save Lois. Right. Which so. is – which, which, which even to this day is uh, – uh, even for a movie, again, a, about a man that could fly and a guy who's trying to blow up the San Andreas fault, it, that's a little – they're stretching my bounds a little bit there, but we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get but, to that uh, in a anyway. second. So, uh, so basically, um, he uh, uh, Miss Tessmacher saves him, takes the takes the kryptonite off of him, uh, which allows him to instantly get better. Yep. <laughs> so Superman, she's like, you have to go save Hackensack. He's like, but Lois, she's like, no, you have to save it because I, you to always tell the truth, and I believe you. So, so he, so he, he's kind of honor bound to do it. So he goes, stops the other, the, the Hackensack missile first, then he flies across the country to the San Andreas Fault, uh, and he he doesn't make it. He the, it hits the San Andreas Fault and then causes a massive earthquake. So he basically, so now what happens is like basically like a fifteen minute more or less action sequence where he basically goes around. Stopping all these disasters from happening, he stops the. He, he tries to put the, uh, the. He tries to kind of fix the fault so it doesn't, you know, cause more of an earthquake. Uh, he saves some kids from bus falling off of, I think, the San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge. Mm, right. Um, he uh, that you know Jimmy Jimmy uh, Olsen is stuck at the Hoover Dam and that blows up, so he stops that. Um, so he he basically does all this stuff, but the last thing he cannot do, he cannot save Lois Lane from from dying in a uh, in a uh, earthquake. And of course, so this is where we get like the famous like uh, shout to the mountains that ah, <laughs> you know he does <laughs> uh, flies yep. up and he gets the the flashback where he hears uh, Jor El say, "You are not allowed to." F- to interfere in human history or whatever um where he you know totally completely ignores that and um flies around the earth rewinding time and going back to save lois now this is a controversial thing as we mentioned earlier um because should the earth spin back on its axis like that it would not Time would not go backwards. Yeah, it exactly. Just, it would just be this hor- horrific, uh, major disaster on a, on a global scale. Um, <laughs> now, some Superman nerds have defended the scene and basically said he's not spinning the Earth around. What he's doing is spinning so fast that the that he's going backwards in time. And the Earth going backwards is just a visual representation of that. I don't buy that. I don't buy that because boy. he, if you, I would, I could see it if, if, if it wasn't for one thing. Because after he goes backwards, he then goes the other way to start spinning it forwards again. So that to me is telling me that yes, he did physically spin it backwards, and now he's spinning it back forward again. So if he was just traveling back in time, he wouldn't need to do that. So that that is why I think that's a that's a BS excuse. Oh yeah, yeah. it's just, just now watching that sequence. It's a great sequence visually. It's a really really uh really engaging sequence. But the logic behind it that oh he's spinning the Earth backwards and somehow that's making time go backwards. It's like yeah, I I, I was with the I was with movie. I was with you until that point, and then it's like okay. I kind of I kind of lost the uh, suspension of disbelief because that's just in no way is that possible. Even in a universe where there's a, a guy that could fly, you know, right. it's just it's just it's it's too it's too out there, you know. So that's always the part that always would kind of take me out of the movie. But everything else is solid. But up up to that point, it's just and, and it's, it's sad because it's it's the climax. That's the end of the movie. But you know, it's it's just too unbelievable. Yeah, and um, it's funny because, it, it, you know, like 10 years later, more or less, um, DC Comics kind of did like a reboot of their entire like 50, 60 year history of comics. Um, and they rebooted, not a reboot, but like a, 
I guess you would call it a reboot. They had a, they had a they had a, an event called Crisis on Infinite Earths where they basically all these different multiple universes like came together and formed just one Earth. Um, and uh, whenever they did that, they kind of uh, started rewriting some of the stuff about you know about some of their characters. One of the things they did was they started toning down some of Superman's powers. So I mean, and I think this is so like in the comics now. Superman can't do that. Like in the fifties and sixties and seventies, like in the comics, he probably they probably would have been. They probably did stuff like that. But basically, in the comics, I mean, he's still like super freaking powerful. He's you know he's the most powerful man on earth, and he's and he's super fast, and he can fly, and all that stuff. Uh, heat heat vision and X ray vision and all that. But like they keep it to the basics of his powers. They don't make him seem godlike like they do in this movie, right? Which I think yeah. is kind of interesting. Um, uh, like for example, like he like in the up to that point, like he was even faster than the Flash, which is like, well, then why is the Flash even there? So now the Flash is faster than Superman, which is which is kind of how it should be because that's the only thing he has. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> don't take that away don't from take him. Take it away from him, right? Um, anyway, uh, so uh, so it's funny. I I wonder if like this was kind of the one of the the um, what's the word I'm looking for? One of the uh, the instigators to, to starting to limit his powers. Cause that is just so ridiculous. Yes. Uh, yeah. But I mean, overall, I mean, I still love the movie and it's just that part. still It's always going to bother me no matter what, but it's not enough to make me hate the movie. Like I still love the movie, but it's just, I still can't get over that. And I don't think I ever will. Yeah. I, I mean, if you can like, it, 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 I think some people, I think the the whole thing about him actually going backwards in times, and it's just a visual representation of it. I think that's just people having head cannons to the, to make it work better. Oh, I love you that know? term, bro, head cannon. Yeah, I think that's just them to like to to like make it just work better in their mind. And if you want to do that, that's fine. But I don't think that's what the filmmakers intended. Um, right. And and it, it is such a silly sequence, but you know, it is a it is a kind of a they do kind of make it a little bit of a silly movie. Um, so then this is where we kind of go to our climax. Or, or, I mean, this is, you know, he saves Lois. Lois kind of goes, oh, you're never around whenever I need you. Actually, Jimmy says that. Uh, you're never around whenever I need you. And then uh, uh, he flies off, and then uh, Lois goes, wait a minute. Why is Clark never around? And she goes, nah. Uh, <laughs> um, then, we have, well, then we see uh, Superman drop off Lex and uh, Otis at, at jail. Um, and then we're finally Which you could uh, have done from the beginning, yeah. <laughs> but you know, where, where Lex, uh, where Lex kind of finally takes off one of the many wigs he's been wearing, and and where he shows his bald head, and um, and then uh, the warden says, "Thank you, Superman." And he's like, and uh, Superman just smiles, flies away, flies around the Earth, and winks to the camera, and then we get credits. Yep, that's it. So that's Superman. Um. It, that to me, to me, that shot of him winking at the uh, winking at the audience at the end of the film is um, uh, is one of the kind of iconic screen images. I think it's such a it's such a kind of um, I, I always remember that whenever I was. I think they ended a lot of Superman films like that. And maybe I don't think all of them, but I think at least two or three of them ended like that. I know at least two, uh, one and two ended that way. Um, I don't know about the others because I haven't watched them enough to remember. <laughs> But I know Superman 2 ends the same way as well. Right. Um, so so one of the things that I kind of want to talk about, uh, the, the film is a little bit of a – it's a little campy. So like uh, yeah. think, if you watch the film uh, – and I understand that like some – damn millennials uh who watch the film today <laughs> that are used to you know your dark knight trilogies and your uh, marvel cinematic universes uh watch this film and they think it's kind of corny and cheesy um and i can understand that but i, I think with people who think that just aren't they don't really get the superman character which is why the superman character in the last couple of movies has been so dark and grim is that i think people want like a more serious superman when he's not supposed to be you know he's supposed to be this kind of like virtuous you know kind of kansas cornball and that the tone of this movie kind of fits that i agree i agree um the uh there's a stark contrast between uh how I feel about, you know, this Superman as opposed to the current DCEU Superman. And then when you compare, you know, current Batman with 
60s Batman. And I've, I've already made my hatred for 60s Batman known on many, many podcasts. Um, but, uh, but see, Batman to me is always supposed to be the serious character and see him dance around like a buffoon, even though I love Adam West to death. I, I can't, I just can't watch that, man. As, 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 as great as some of those episodes may be, that's just not Batman to me. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, that to me is more in line with Superman. Like Superman is supposed to be, like you said, the kind of cornball, you know, but he's supposed to be, you know, truth, justice in the American way. Not this like sad emo sap, you know, uh, that, you know, he was kind of portrayed as in Man of Steel going for. I mean, Justice he kind of rectified it a little bit like we talked about earlier, but he was – they were trying to make him super serious. And like you said, and I agree with you, that's that's not Superman. Um, but you see kind of the contrast between the, the the whole Batman and Superman thing to me. It's just I can't see Batman like that, which is why I will, I will never take 60s Batman seriously. <laughs> but uh, but Superman kind of fits that bill. So if they had done that with Superman instead of Batman, I would have I probably would <laughs> have I'd probably have the box set of that of that uh, of that series, you know. I don't know. I, I still I still appreciate the animals. I know, but I, I can't I appreciate it for I, what it is. Um, I can't. I, I get I get it. I get it. But You know, it's funny because, like, the best contrast, you know, because when you watch Batman v Superman, there's, like, not really any difference between those two characters. Like, they're both just these dark, brooding dudes. But the best contrast between the two characters is if you take Christopher Reeve's Superman and Michael Keaton's Batman. Like, those are both the opposite ends of the spectrum. You know, like, and and they were all kind of in the same era. I mean, Batman was, like, like a year or two after the Christopher Reeve, last Christopher Reeve movie. But right. I mean, the, they they're more or less in the same era, and that that to me is like the best you know, contrast. If you want to see what the best contrast of those two characters is, that that's what it is right there. Uh, if you wanted if, if a, a real Batman v Superman movie would have had those two guys, <laughs> if, that, if that had all if that had been possible at all back and, then, and they but. did. I, I you know when Batman v Superman came out, you know you saw like recut trailers using footage from the original Superman and the original Batman eighty nine and stuff, which was now, that know, would have been awesome, which was before. clever, you know. But you know it also kind of made you think. Oh, I wish we had gotten that instead. Yeah. In some parallel universe, it exists though. So. Um, Couple other things I wanted to mention. Uh, the this is right smack in the middle of the legendary John Williams musical score run. I mean, right before this, you had Jaws, you had Star Wars. Right mm-hmm. after this, you had Raiders of the Lost Ark and ET. I mean, this is like this is whenever he's on home run after home run. Yeah, uh, the legendary in the middle of his legendary streak and. Uh... Such a such a wide spanning career. Like I love Johnny Williams. <laughs> I mean, he's. I don't know. If, and I hate to say this, and I maybe I'm not using the correct term, but yeah, the the, the recent Star Wars scores. I don't want to say he's phoning it in, but I mean, the Last Jedi score wasn't even that great, to be honest. It wasn't even that that. Yeah, unique. I'm a little surprised it got an Oscar nom. To be honest, it, yeah, it, it was fine. And I don't think he was phoning it in at all, but it, it's just it comes off that way when there's nothing. When, when you hear a John Williams score, you expect at least one like kind of not so much iconic, but a memorable you know piece that you take away from it. Whereas with Last Jedi, you don't get any of that. At least with Force Awakens, Ray seemed to me stuck out to me, but there was nothing from Last Jedi that stuck out to me at all. Yeah, and it, honestly, I think the prequel. The prequel scores are better. Duel of the Fates, bro. Duel of the Fates. I mean, even Attack of the Clones, which I hate that movie, but that score is better than The Last the Jedi. Cross the Stars was yeah. the thing that came out of that. And then Battle of the Heroes from, from Sith. Yeah. You know? Like, it, it's it's odd that – all right, whatever. But, um, it, yeah, it, it, but, the, I mean, the Superman score, iconic. Like, everyone knows it. Everyone can recognize it. Um, And, you know, it started this – it started like a tradition with this, and then again in 1989 with Batman, of the superhero theme of the superhero march, where like the right. beginning of the film is the credits with the themes with the theme music over it, and that's what Batman did as well. Spider Man actually did it too, um, although right. that theme is not as recognizable. I, I could recognize if I heard it, I'd recognize it, but it's not like you can hum the Superman theme, you can hum the Batman theme, you can't hum the Spider Man theme. Like, yeah, I was gonna try to do it like dun 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 dun. It's it's hard, like because it's it's not as I guess hummable as the other. 
So. And like some of the other superheroes have it, like the the X Men movies have like a, a motif, but it's not quite the same. Um, the uh, the Avengers has it, but it's not quite as good. Like you, so like I know in the last two Avengers trailers, you you heard like variations of it, so you could recognize it. But it's still like I kind of miss like the movie starting with the the credits and the theme. Yeah, you know, like and they haven't really done that since. Really, Spider Man, I think, was the last time they did it. The Spider Man movies was the last time. You they might did be it. right about that because um, the MCU movies don't don't start like that at all. No, they don't. Um, and again, I think maybe one of the X Men movies did because I know the X Men movies do kind of have a theme, um, like da 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 da. You know, uh, I think they they have that theme, but it's it's again, it's not quite as memorable as the. As Superman or Batman, so I, I like that would be like the one, and that's the thing that kind of bugged me about the DCEU. I get they don't want to like, they don't want to, um, they want to start their own thing, but they should have just brought back the Superman score for Man of Steel. They should just brought it back. <laughs> like, uh, who did it? Like Hans Zimmer or something? Like it was fine, but I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't the the John Williams one. But you can't hum that one though, because it, it, it's kind of like the uh, the the Batman Begins, like the, the 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 Nolan Batman theme. It's cool, I love it, but you can't really hum it. You yeah, know? it's, it's not... just like because it's just like did it, did it, did it. It's just like it's not really like it's yeah. You can't hum it. It's just like this this like attack, you know, of of music, yeah. you know. But I, I mean, I don't get. I love that theme. It, it's it's it, it fits right, but you can't hum it. And that's you know, and the closest thing to like you were saying, the closest thing we have to that is the Avengers theme. But what kills it is that the movie doesn't start with that theme. You hear it at the end, yeah, I think over the credits. But yeah, I kind of wish we we had that again. That, that's one thing I would bring back to superhero movies is is the is that opening march. Yeah. All right. Anyway, um, so let's uh, so just real quick, let's wrap up some on some of the legacy here. So the the movie. Uh, was released just in time for Christmas. Uh, it became a massive uh, success. It was the second highest grossing film of the year behind Greece. Uh, we talked about Greece ha! a little earlier. Um, and at this point became uh, the sixth highest movie, highest grossing movie of all time at that point. Um, currently still in the top 100 uh, of all time. Um, it was the, at that point, the most successful Warner Brothers movie ever made at that point. Um, it would spawn uh, three sequels, Superman 2, Superman 3, and Superman 4, The Quest for Peace, each decreasing <laughs> in quality. Uh, it had a... Like the, just like the Death Wish films, bro. <laughs> yeah. Uh, two is good. I like two. But three is bad, and four is holy crap bad. Um, uh, then uh, they were returned to the but, character. But, but, no, no. What, no. What redeems four, <laughs> in my opinion, is the fact that it was canon, bro, and I love canon. So, well, but... <laughs> Canon films. Just the fact yeah. that it has canon films attached to it is what makes it. Is what make, I, I can't even finish my sentence, bro. Because I, I think canon films, I just start cracking up. Because See, they're giving the me so about, many classics. Here's the thing about Superman 3 and 4, though. Like, Superman 3 has that bit of, like, you know, we were talking earlier about the, like, watching cheesy movies and stuff. Superman 3 has that going for it, where, like, there, there are, like, just funny moments in that film that are. Are you're not really laughing because it was intentionally funny, but you're just laughing because I can't believe they did this. This is so dumb. Like whenever he's just sitting when when he becomes evil Superman and he's sitting at the bar like flicking peanuts at people. And stuff. Yes. Like and he's got like a five o'clock shadow to show that he's evil. Evil like, now, yeah. That's, that's, and he's that's like what, drinking that's a what beer. Face means, yeah. <laughs> like that stuff is funny to me, right? But the Superman four is just there's nothing redeeming about it. It's just bad. It's just so bad. Yeah, and I liked it, it as a kid. Don't get me wrong. I liked it as a kid because I was like – I was dumb. I was a seven-year-old kid that was seeing Superman in the theater. I was just seeing a guy flying around like in, in his red and blue tights. Like that's all I needed, All I needed, right? But uh, yeah. The fact when, that, they, that they reuse shots like 20 different times, oh was like, that's like criminal, bro. <laughs> you so don't bad. do that. <laughs> um, you had a, a return to the um, – you had a return to the the franchise in 2006 when Brian Singer brought back. Uh, it did, he didn't reboot it, uh, but he did ignore Superman three and four and went like so. His his Superman Returns takes place after Superman two. Yep, he uh, got he Godfather three them, bro. Yeah, yeah. He basically <laughs> said Superman three and four do not exist. 
Um, that was not a big success. I mean, it made money and it was profitable, but it wasn't that 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 same old tired. It wasn't as profitable as they would have wanted. So the the Superman franchise kind of got buried uh, until Man of Steel in 2013, uh, which really, other than uh, other than Wonder Woman, that that whole franchise, that whole DC franchise, has not been good. Um, yeah. But, you know, as we said earlier, without Superman, you would never would have gotten Batman 89. You never would have gotten the X-Men franchise. You never would have gotten the Spider-Man trilogy. You never gotten the Dark Knight trilogy. You never would have gotten the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So Superman uh, paved the way for all of that. Yeah, and that's where ultimately the legacy lies. You, you can talk about, uh, you know... The, the the climax of the film and no, to, like I said to me it still bothers me you can talk about all these other different things about the movie but it's ultimate legacy is that it was the superhero film for a long time and it's that title that it earned that allowed this kind of superhero bubble to start forming it didn't happen right away but it allowed that bubble to be able to to form in the future and because of that we have these other iconic superhero films so it owes all its it owes its its origin to christopher reeve to donner to the salkins and to superman so yep um so that that is that is the legacy of superman um i did want to quickly talk about um because i because i own it and i wanted to talk a little bit about it uh the extended editions. Um, so there's a in in the eighties. Um, whenever they sold this movie off for TV, uh, the Saul kinds, ever the carnies, um, started a- added delete added back deleted scenes, all the deleted scenes basically, and the music back into the movie uh, because they could make more money from advertising on longer cuts of the movie. And I think the first time they showed it on TV it was split up into two nights. Uh, with the one half being on one night and the other half being on the other night. Um, and, uh, you know, at first they aired it on ABC, and then a few years later it was aired on CBS. Uh, but then but the, a lot of those scenes, like the um, the special effects weren't great on it, and um, but it didn't really matter because you're watching it on, you know, network television in the 80s. I mean, how the, the, where the you didn't have high definition back then, right? Um, then in 2001, they, they did a DVD release of the special edition – which only added about eight minutes of extra stuff in it. Um, so this like three hour some version of the TV edition never made it to. Nobody ever saw it uh, on home video until just this past fall when they re- they finally released it on Blu-ray, and it's called the Superman Extended Edition. It's the three hour eight minute version of the movie, um, which I bought obviously because I I'm a Superman dork, so I need to see it, and honestly. It's it's fun to watch one time, but I don't know if this this didn't need to be a three hour movie. <laughs> it's one of those things where to watch it you have to devote a whole afternoon, and I can do that with some movies, but I can't do that with everything. And it feels like it's it's one. Of, I haven't watched it because I haven't bought it yet, but um, it feels like it's one of those movies where you have to devote a whole afternoon because it's so long. Like with Watchmen or like with Lord of the Rings extended cuts, like you have to devote a whole day for those, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm not, I'm, not, I don't think that's something I'm prepared to do. I'm, I think I'm just gonna stick with my original theatrical cut <laughs> and call it a day. But I mean, it, it, I just, I'm, I like that something like that exists, though. Yeah, I, I like that it exists. I'm, all, I'm always a big fan of of, of releasing different cuts uh, of films. Um, so, for example, um, so they added an extra forty five minutes to the to the movie, and there's only one sequence that's like basically new. So. So, so some of the changes are that there's more time on Krypton. Uh, there's more time focusing on the the explosion of Krypton. You see, like basically more bodies falling, more people dying. Um, there's um, longer Smallville sequences, um, but again, they're this, they're just the original sequences that are in the theatrical cut, but like extended past the point where it was cut in the first film, right? Um, right. More scenes with Lex and Otis and Miss Tessmacher, but again just longer versions of the original scenes. Um, you get a little more interaction with Jor-El uh, and, and Clark in the Fortress of Solitude. Um, you get you get Superman fixing the Hollywood sign that falls over, um, and you get a longer earthquake sequence. But the only thing that's really kind of notable that's that's new is the gauntlet sequence where, 
when he shows up at Lex Luthor's uh, underground hideout, whatever you want to call it, uh, he has to go through like a series of traps that Luthor lays for him. Um, like there's machine guns, and then he tries freezing him, then he has to walk through fire, all sorts of stuff. So that's like the only kind of really cool new addition. The rest of it yeah. is mostly just longer versions of everything of all the other scenes. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I, maybe that that scene made it onto YouTube. I'll, I'll check it out that way because it, it's already piqued my interest. But uh, but uh, I don't know if I'll ever like. I, don't, I mean, honestly, I don't know if I'll ever watch it. I, I want to try to one day. I'm sure I will, but. I'm not really like itching to go check that out. Uh, let me see if it's on YouTube. I'm gonna look for you. Um, no, I don't see. I don't see how you would find it, honestly. Yeah. But anyway, he basically runs a gauntlet underneath Lex Luthor's lair, where he has to go through all these traps that he's and he walks through all of them really easily. But it's just it's just kind of another fun like here's more of his powers at work here. Um, right. And uh, so that's really – but basically the rest of it is mostly just uh, uh, adding uh, adding f- more time to scenes that are already there. Um, so 2018 marks the 40th anniversary of this film. I don't know if they're going to do anything special for it. Um, I, I doubt it because they I think they've released many different editions of this film already. So yeah, who, who, who knows? Uh, as I said earlier, the the film was a huge huge hit um, in the box office. It did it was nominated for several Academy Awards, uh, one for best special effects. Uh, it was nominated for best sound, best film editing, and best music, but didn't win any of those. Um, and it is uh, it, no, this is I think a little shocking on AFI's 100 Heroes list. Superman only made it to number 26. I feel like, come on. Mm. Superman, number 26, should be higher than that. Yeah, at least top 20. At Uh, least. I'd put him in the top five, personally. But, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think Atticus Finch is number one, which, all right. Uh, All right. right. (laughs) Okay. Whatever. Uh, uh, Okay, so... I got a couple recommendations here. Now, it'd be easy to just pick out, like, well, any superhero movie's recommendation. But I want to pick out two specifically. One would be Batman 89 um, as a recommendation, just because uh, th- that was the first Batman film. This is the first Superman film. And it's just fun to see, like, the two contrast each other as, like, the kind of Superman was the kind of the beginning of the superhero genre. And then Batman was, like, kind of the second entry into that. Um, but it was like a different kind of feel of a movie. And the other one I would recommend is the first Spider-Man movie because that movie feels like the first Superman movie. It almost has, follows the same formula as far as, or as far as telling an origin story goes. And Sam Raimi basically even said that the first Superman movie is, is a perfect origin story, and he basically followed it to make the first Spider-Man. So and those... and and on, and on that front too, actually, I would recommend Batman Begins because even Nolan followed the the Donner formula as well. Yeah. So um, that that uh, that to me, uh, so so Spider-Man, Batman eighty nine, Batman Begins, those are all uh, pretty strong recommendations. I think um, it is available pretty much anywhere streaming. Although the extended version uh, is only on physical media right now. I don't. I, I looked to see if it was uh, streaming anywhere. Uh, it's not. But uh, the regular theatrical edition and the special edition are both available on all streaming platforms to buy. Uh, awesome. Now, before we get on to uh, our plugs and uh, and say goodbye here, we are going to do our pull out the random movie generator, and we're going to find out what our next movie is. All right, here we go. Let's do this. And here we go. And our next movie. Aha! Our next movie is our first sequel. And it is a sequel to a movie we've already done. Yes. And uh, the film is The Empire Strikes Back. Oh, oh boy. Oh, yeah. Uh, and of course, I'm, and this is so cliche to say these days, my favorite Star Wars films, as is, as is. Probably for maybe seventy five percent of the Star Wars fandom, Empire is their favorite Star Wars film. So uh, I'm not like blowing people's minds here. So, but I'm excited to talk about it. There's a really good stuff, really good stuff here, and a lot to get into. Yeah. So, so Empire will be our next film. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, and uh, so please follow us on uh, EssentialFilmsPodcast.com. 
Email us at EssentialFilmsPodcast at gmail.com. Like The Essential Films on Facebook and follow at Essential Films on Twitter. And please like, rate, and review us on, uh, subscribe to us on, on iTunes. Uh, also, the YouTube page, uh, youtube.com slash Adolfo J. Acosta, where I'm putting up uh, our Force Perspective shows and other episodes of The Essential Films. And speaking of Force Perspective, Mark? All righty. So um, you can follow Force Perspective on Twitter at FP Movie Podcast. We're also on Instagram at FPM Podcast. Uh, if you have any questions or comments about Force Perspective, or I'll even take essential films questions as well, if you want to contact me about that, you can email FPM Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, I have some random musings on Twitter as well. If you want to read any of that, you can follow me at SportsGuy515. Um, I think the last episode that's up as of this recording is 107, where we did, uh, I believe that was the Red Sparrow episode. So we had Red Sparrow, we did Death Wish, and a few other movies. Um, episode 108 is coming up uh, this week. We are, we're still talking about which movies we're going to do, but it's more in line with the recent releases like Tomb Raider, Love, Simon, Thoroughbreds. I definitely want to talk about that one. Um, so it's going to be a fun time. And then the following week, we're planning... You know, more of the recent stuff as well. Isle of Dogs I want to get into as well because I'm seeing that this weekend. And a few of the other ones. So definitely check out Force Perspective. We got more of the recent stuff coming up. Uh, so uh, definitely tune into that. Yeah, speaking of origin stories, uh, Tomb Raider, that was pretty much an origin story. Uh, uh, let's, let's not. Uh, uh, the yeah, less said we'll, about we'll that, ta- the we'll better. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about the it. The less said about that, the better. So. <laughs> Uh, all right, so that'll about do it for us. Uh, you know, again, stay like Mark said, stay tuned for Force Perspective 108, and then stay tuned for our next essential films, which we The Empire Strikes Back. And until next time, don't thank us, we're all part of the same team. <laughs>